My name is Dr. Charles Gulo. I'm a cancer immunologist by training. I'm currently a faculty member, assistant professor here with Duke NUS, and I have two roles. My primary role is a um, content expert for the immunology uh, area of, of medical, medical immunology in the first year. Okay. So that's in the body and disease course. So I'm responsible to make sure the students learn immunology. The second role I have is throughout the entire first year, I work as a facilitator at different sessions and I help the faculty interact with the students, something that's a very powerful thing we do during our team lead process here. Many of us have additional roles, and so I'm a researcher with uh, Singapore General Hospital and have been for about seven and a half, eight years, running a cancer immunology laboratory. So as an immunologist who does cancer research, I uh, you know, get students in, hire folks, write grants, write papers, and things like that. The whole scientific research thing that, that goes on um, in a, in a laboratory-based, sort of a wet-based laboratory. Okay, that's a good question. Um, research is something that's very important in this medical school and we devote almost an entire year for it here. Um, there are three areas of research that can be broadly divided. Again, these are not distinct areas, but something for you to think about if, if you choose and, and you want to come here. And that is that um, the, the first area would be basic science and basic research. That's very lab bench intensive. So you're going to spend your time, if you choose to do that kind of research, in the laboratory fully. You won't be interacting with patients, and you probably won't be interacting with patient material or using patient material in your research. But for those of you who have very little research experience, um, very basic bench research is probably good for you. And there are a lot of examples of it, and you, you'll learn about them, and, and you can discuss with people about them when you come here. The second area would be translational research, and that's getting a little bit closer now to the what we call bench to bedside. It's getting a little bit closer to the bedside. You're not doing pure clinical research, but what you're doing is research that's related to the patient now. So you might actually be going to the wards and collecting material, or you might be working with a clinician, but in the laboratory. So you're still doing wet bench research, but you're doing it with either material or with information from the patient, and that's translational research. Good examples of that would be immunology, stem cell research, neurology, um, and a number of other areas, okay? And then the uh, last broad area is clinical research. And as you can imagine, in clinical research, you will be in the wards, or you'll be looking at patient records. You'll be actually working with patients. Um, you might be looking at a therapy, for example, right in the patient or with the patient. Again, a lot of this is paperwork. Some of it's database management, looking at effects of a drug in the past. Um, and things like that. So there are a lot of different terms used for it, but basically that is completely um, bedside-based research. Again, three areas, basic, translational, and clinical. So how exact are these areas, three areas? And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, they're not. They're not exact at all. And in fact, many labs do a little bit of both. My research lab was based quite a bit on basic lab bench work, but it was translational because we were thinking about vaccine development. And we did get tissues from, patient, from patients, but again, we did a lot of both. So a lot of laboratories, especially here at Duke NUS and the ones you're gonna find in Singapore if you, if you join, will be doing the basic and the translational. And then even from the translational clinical, you might be going back and forth between the lab to the uh, clinics. So it is not distinct, and these are just broad areas for you to try to decide for yourself, do I want to do more clinical work, or do, should I do more basic work because maybe I lack in some of the skills and the knowledge sets that, um, that I'd like to use in, in the future. If you have an extensive research experience already when you're joining here, for example, a master's, a PhD, or a lot of research in your undergrad, you might migrate to translational and uh, clinical, for example. You might still wish to do lab bench. So anyway, they're not distinct, and they're general, and they overlap. But it's a nice way to categorize them in your, in your head. So some other tips that you might want to um, think about in terms of uh, picking a laboratory when you're here. And I know, I know that's in the future, but um, other issues of, race, of research would be the lab size. Um, big labs 
offer wonderful opportunities um, for, for lots of different things going on. And when you have lab meetings, you'll learn about a lot of things. You might be doing one area of research, but if it's a big lab, there are likely to be three or four other things going at the same time, if not more. However, so that the trade-off is that your mentor will be very busy, and you might not be mentored by the PI, the, the guy who runs the lab. You might have a postdoc or somebody else who mentors you. So there's a trade-off. On the other hand, you might have a joint, want to join a small lab. A small lab will have a more narrow focus, won't be doing as much, but you get a lot of individualized attention from the PI. The same thing is true, and, and I, by the way, neither one of which is better or worse. It depends on your personality, and these are the kinds of things you, you want to think about. The other thing that you might want to think about is, is and which is related, is uh, seniority of the PI. So a very, very, very senior PI is probably going to spend less time with you, but have very well-developed grants and funding. Whereas a very junior PI, part of what he's doing is spending a lot of time with you so that you both develop together so that you get these papers out, uh, manuscripts or something that are very important in labs. So these are all trade-offs. The other thing, the last thing I want to mention is think about the kind of research you want to do. Some people are very technology-oriented. Some people like to join a lab where they're actually developing a tool. Other people, and I, I'll be honest, I tend to be like this other group, they like to uh, ask... They, they don't want to develop tools. They want, okay, give me the tools that are already out there. I want to apply them for this particular situation. Cancer, immunology, vaccine development. I don't want to be a tools development person. I prefer to just apply them. And so these are the kinds of things that you'll be asking yourself. And please remember, the faculty who are out there doing research, you should ask them these questions. Do not be shy. This is not an insult to them. How big is your lab? Do you focus on tools? Do you apply? Do you do lab bench work or are you in the clinic? These are very important because they will make you, they will make or break the kind of interest that you have when you join the lab. Very important. In the past, a number of people have asked whether or not when they come to this university, I mean, this is a Duke, Duke NUS graduate medical school, whether they're actually doctors or researchers. First thing I want to say is a very common misconception, and I hope you don't have this as, as potential future doctors. The word doctor can, does not mean practicing physician. Many of us have PhDs. We're doctors. You can have a doctor, doctoral thesis in history. You're still a doctor. Okay? So the term is misused by people on the street, actually, and, and that's fine because they don't understand what I'm about to say. And I think you understand this, which is a person who practices medicine is a doctor, but he's a medical doctor or a practicing physician or another term, clinician. So I think you, you will understand that, but I think there's a lot of misconception on, on that term. Now, but the second uh, part is, am I a researcher or am I a doctor? Hey, when you come to this university and if you go through the first four years of this process, you are the same as anybody else who has joined any other medical program where you will be an MD, or at least you will have the requisites to now practice medicine. You've got to do other things, by the way, to continue, do residencies, housemanships, and whatever, what have you, before you can actually be allowed to practice medicine, but you're a medical doctor and you're a clinician. However, unlike other places, you are a research, you have done a whole year, almost an entire year of research, so you have... Um, you're research intensive, if you will, and some of you will go on to do research, but you're a medical doctor first. If you choose to do a PhD program with us, and we do have a PhD program, then you will be a research doctor. You'll be both. You'll graduate with a medical degree and a PhD degree. But you are not a researcher per se. You're a researcher because in the future your career will, um, you will start accepting more and more research with your career, but you're still a practicing doctor. A big concern with a number of people, um, and it's a valid concern, is, you know, it's about, about eight months in your third year, eight months, give or take a few weeks, you know, uh, is the amount of time that you're given to do research, okay? So that's a lot more than other schools. However, there is a valid concern that many of you might have, which is, is that enough time? Well, I'm going to answer it with no. It's definitely not enough time to do a full research project like a PhD would do or um, even a master's to, student would do takes years. So definitely it's not enough time to conquer an entire um, 
hypothesis or an entire, you know, get a, a nature paper or a paper in cell or a manuscript. However, having said that, it is definitely enough time for you to work on something, get a thesis done, for some of you to get a paper done and submit it. It is enough time for you to get some data. It is enough time for you to become a mini expert in a particular area that you choose. And it is enough time for you to get what we want, which is thinking a little bit more like a researcher. Although you are a clinician, we want you to be able to tackle and to tackle research ideas and to think like a researcher. And I think eight months is clearly uh, a long enough period for you to start thinking. But actually, it just opens the door for you for the future if you decide to do more research along with your clinical work. So, no, it's not enough time, but yes, it's enough time for you to learn to think like a researcher. I have been here uh, in Singapore for eight years, and I am American. I still am American, um, although I can say la and know how to use it in a sentence. Um, yeah, so, so there are some really big cultural and, and um, you know, a lot of changes when I first came here. Um, and let me, let me start off by telling you a story that probably really epitomizes that. And that is when I left Boston, and that's in the northeast of the United States, it was March in 2003. I left very, very early in the morning, like 5.30 in the morning, and the plane was actually delayed by an hour. And it was delayed by an hour because it needed to be de-iced. The plane was all frozen. Okay, so you can get an idea of how cold it was. And they had to use the foam and these big machines to come and de-ice it. Very interesting, but we were delayed an hour. 18 hours later, I arrive in Singapore. Midnight, okay, midnight. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, midnight. At night, things cool down. Step outside of Changi Airport, a huge wave of heat and humidity almost knocks me over. And I was just earlier in a freezing situation. So that is the start of my Singapore experience. And by the way, I love it here and I've gotten used to it here, but the temperature still gets me and I still am like perspiring nonstop, but I'm used to it now. Um, so yeah, that was something that I've, I've struggled to get used to, which is the constant heat and humidity for me, not being used to it all the time. The other things, there are a number of other things that are, are um, quite different for me, and food was one of them. I actually love the different kinds of food here. I love Malay food, I love Chinese food, I love Indian food, I love spicy food, I love, uh, just don't ask me to eat the smelly tofu, that I draw a line in. But, um, you know, that is something, and I, and I enjoy it. I enjoy eating different kinds of things. For some Americans, it is very difficult. They don't like spicy food. They don't like chicken feet and things like that, but I, I relish it. Great, give me some more. So that's, um, but that, that is something I had to get used to and, and slowly eat things I wasn't familiar with. Um, you know, there are a number of cultural things that are very different from Americans uh, and other Westerners when you come here. You know, it, it, it's not 100% different. Everyone has different um, relationships with culture, if you will. But one of the things that's very common in the United States is to speak how you feel. If you're angry with someone, you say, I'm angry with you. And you let them know. You get it right off your chest. If you're really, really happy with them, you also do that. Well, one of the things I've noticed when you come here is that you might not want to do that. You might want to be a little bit more subtle and a little bit more gentle. And if you're angry with someone, slowly let them know. You certainly don't confront them on the spot. And, I, and it, it took me a while to realize this, but I think you know, that, that, that I have been, uh, come, come to understand. And there are other cultural things and, and things. And I think it's fun because there's quite a number of different races here that I'm not used to and uh, celebrations and cultural things that I've now gotten used to. The issue of Ang Pao, the issue of fasting, the issue of um, Deepavali and, and things like that and the celebration of lights. You know, these are all very interesting and they're unique to me. I always don't understand what's going on frequently, but uh, I still enjoy it. I do have some interests outside of the, of, you know, the things I've already talked about, the academic things. And one of the things that I've done recently, and, and the biggest thing that I've, um, I think I'm interested in outside, is, is um, developing a website that actually reaches out to the non-scientific community. Because you know what I've been doing for many years is reaching out to a very important but small community of scientists that are working on very specific things. And I realized later, you know, how, how can I actually reach out to more people? And so I've developed something called uh, Cancer Made Simple. 
And it's a website that, again, it's a website that actually reaches out to the average person on the street. And what it does is it provides them a lot of information about what cancer is. What are the therapies used for cancer? What are some of the non-traditional uh, alternative uh, issues, to, like uh, therapies and things like that as well? I don't just focus on the science hard facts, but I, and I, and I, you know, I give uh, information about things that are alternative. Traditional Chinese medicine, for example, very important in this region. I also provide uh, resources for um, places to go for people. And I actually, uh, in addition to this Cancer Made Simple, I actually have a blog. And then that blog, that Simple Cancer at WordPress, I actually go into various issues. Whatever the issue is of the day, I'll expand upon that. When new therapy comes out, for example, I'll talk about it. So, um, yeah, that is something that I kind of feel marriages both my academic interests and some of volunteerism sort of reaching out to the community.